I'm Ann Charles. Hello, I'm Keith Gosland. And I'm Linda Quinlan. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. It is Tuesday, May 17th. We're taping at Orca Media in Mount Pelia, which we acknowledge as indigenous land. So who goes first? Anne does. Anne goes first. Anne's what asleep. Are your, what, are your, what are your <clears throat> headlines, Anne? Well, I've many, as usual. Um, they are as follows. Malta retains the top spot for the Rainbow Europe rights uh, map. We'll talk more about that. The UK has dropped to 14th in the Rainbow Europe's rankings for LGBTQ plus rights, scoring 53 out of a possible 100. The leader of Russian activist band Pussy Riot fled Russia disguised as a food delivery worker. I have a picture before you now of Maria Alokaina. She's 33, she goes by Masha. And we'll talk a little more about her momentarily. Uh, Russia launches a homophobic Guess Who's Gay reality TV competition. Then I have news from North America. The Honduran government admits responsibility for a trans woman's murder. And I have a picture before you now of Vicky Hernandez. She was murdered in 2009. Um, and I'll tell you more about that. And uh, an LG, my last news story is an LGBTQ activist in El Salvador receives death threats. His name is Eric Ivan Ortiz. And I have a picture before you now of him. We'll talk a little more about that. But in an upbeat ending, uh, Linda has granted me permission to uh, announce the winners of the 2021, uh, the 34th annual Publishing Triangle Award. So that's something to anticipate as I go through my pretty mixed news stories. So those are my headlines. Those are books, right, Ian? They are books, yes, okay. and writers. And writers, okay. Keith. Uh, how, how can I compete with books and writers? I... <laughs> so our trivia question today, May 17th, is International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. Why May 17th? So before we move on to some of the events happening in our backyard, I'm going to answer Linda's query from our last show. And yes, indeed, since 2005, the first Saturday in May has been International Naked Gardening Day. <laughs> but not to be undone, there is also a World Naked Bike Ride. And this year, it's on June 12th. There will be an event here in Montpelier. If you are interested, meet at one o'clock at the Dog River Park and Ride. You're going to go down the bike path, down Main Street to the State House for what's advertised as a photo opportunity. I'll, I'll be looking for you, Linda. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so events coming up and, and we've been promoting them. So you, you all know that June 3rd through the 5th is Central Vermont Pride, but there's some new additions, such as on Sunday, June 5th, is an all-day queer film festival at the Savoy. Mm -hmm. And they're also going to be showing queer films that following Tuesday, June 7th at 545. I went on to the Savoy website and I couldn't find a listing of which films, but hopefully as it gets closer, it's going to be there. And Linda, I'm told there I'm might be it now. 
No. I'm, I'm told there might be something Wednesday, June 1st at the Kellogg Library. No, that has has gone uh, gone uh, away. Oh, okay. Never Sorry. mind. Never mind. Keep in mind, however, that the next Saturday, June eleventh, is the Central Vermont Drag Ball at the Old Labor Hall, and then at the end of the month, on June twenty fifth, Cedar Meadows in Castleton is doing a Pride event on site with the Burlesque Show in the evening. That same day is Bethel Pride being organized by the folks at Babes, and they've added a Friday night, June 24th, Pride Prom, and they really want to encourage our youth to show up for this, and it's going to be at the local church from 6 to 9 p.m., and then on Sunday, the 26th, Queer Connect in Bennington is doing their Pride events. Now, the Pride Center of Vermont has made a commitment and has been trying to diligently keep up with all of these activities so that you could go onto their website, get details, know exactly the itinerary for the day and how to connect with it. So before I turn this over to Linda, I wanna do a shout out. The Advocate Magazine has just published their list of Champions of Pride for 2022. And included on that list is an old friend of ours, H.B. Lozito, who uh -huh. they are the executive director of Out in the Mountains in Brattleboro. Congratulations, H.B. And just very quickly, in the final days of the legislative session, there was a joint resolution started in the Senate and unanimously endorsed by both chambers. And this is a joint resolution supporting transgender youth and their parents who seek essential medical care for the treatment of gender dysphoria resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly condemns the actions of states to ban best practice medical care for transgender youth and to prosecute their parents for seeking such essential care for their children and be it further resolved that the General Assembly shall explore all available options to assure that transgender youth and their families are safe in Vermont to make the best medical care decisions for themselves in consultation with their health care providers. And from a recent conversation with leadership within the legislator, legislature, this is not just an empty resolution. They are actively pursuing this. So, so with that, Linda, well, I'm going to start with bad news and I'm probably going to end with bad news, but that's the way the country looks to me, even though Anne remains an optimist. Texas can resume its child abuse probes, and I will have more on that. Brittany Griner's uh, Russian stay, I'll have more on that. And anti LGBT candidate Kathy Barnett Barrett. And she's from Pennsylvania, and we'll have more about her. I think it I think, is Barnett, isn't it? I think it might be Barnett. I think it is Barnett, yeah. A suspect is identified in the double murder of newlywed women, and he has committed suicide. I think we talked about this before. He allegedly shot both women, Kylie, Kylie Shute, 24, and Crystal Turner, 38. They were at a campsite, as we recall. Oh, right. And... Um, they felt really weird about this guy that was sort of hanging around there and um, they did catch him and apparently he committed suicide. Then we have sad note for Yuvashe Vad, um, a legendary activist for LGBTQ and civil rights has died. We'll have more about her. That is Irvashe Vaid. That's well, uh, this morning on Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman said, Urvashi Vad, 
So really? It, it, yeah. it, so that's how I knows, yeah. however you pronounce her name. It's yeah. Terrible. It's really heartbreaking. And she was 63. So we'll have yeah. more about her. A pioneer in gay men's health cases passed away. Dr. Anthony Scarcella was the last surviving member of a historic group that centered health care needs on gay men and people living with HIV. He was 71. A California third grade teacher, Tammy Tiber, has been criticized by parents and has received threats after she showed positive videos of LGBTQ pride. Ramon Alexander, a Florida lawmaker, is accused of a sexually harassing men will not seek re-election. Re He's a Democrat from Tallahassee. Oregonians hope, Oregonian hopes to be the nation's first trans male state legislator. And now I'm going to try to pronounce their name, which is Zelozy, Zelozelz Marchant. So, Karine Jean Pierre will be the new White House press secretary. She is black and lesbian, and this is most definitely a historic event. And I have a picture of her, um, and it's very important. And then um, how a lost New York City women's prison tells the story of long forgotten LGBTQ history. I will have more about that. Um, and uh, New York Pride announces its Grand Marshals for 2022. And they are media influencer Tiz Madison, trans athlete Schuler Baylor, and ACLU attorney Chase Strangio. So that will be there. GOP senators urge. Now, this is another one that you can, as I say, you can't make up. GOP senators urge TV ratings bond to warn viewers of disturbing LGBTQ content. This was proposed by Senators Braun, Republican Indiana, Marshall, Republican Kansas, Lee, Republican Utah, and Grammar, Republican Utah. So, uh, while we're pausing, let me defer to Keith. I just looked up the pronunciation. It is Urvashi, Urvashi Vade. So we stand corrected. And Amy Goodman, too. But well, go there ahead. we go. And you know what? When I get back to the story, I'll probably have to be. That's OK. We're ready well, to it, it's only because Urvashi was the person who started the Creating Change conferences in Washington, DC which brought, was the first time to bring together queer activists from across the country. So I got to spend time with her when she was really helping to pull our communities together. Well, I remember her early work in Boston when she was founding the LGBTQ task force. And most recently she's been involved in the LGBTQ museum in New York, and we saw her on Gay USA, and she was talking about that work. Yeah. And also, we're sort of um, taking over Linda's story, but also, you know, she spoke unflinchingly about her battle against cancer and how the odds weren't good. What an admirable person! And I'm sure Linda will tell us more about her. I'll tell you about the book she wrote, and you know, good, good. So. Um, it's predicted Elon Musk will allow Twitter to amplify hate just in time for the elections. And he will also welcome back Trump. Aren't we all looking forward to that? U.S. Senator says, yes, it may be true that COVID gives people AIDS. U.S. Senator Johnson, Wisconsin, responded to a man claiming at one of his talks that COVID vaccines gave people AIDS. And the Senator replied, well, what you say may be true. Iconic Andy Warhol printing of Marilyn Monroe sets a record at auction. 
So there you go, Ann. Um, now we'll go to your extended stories. All right, thank you. Um, Malta, as I said, has kept the top spot for Rainbow Europe rights. Um, this is the 2022 report of respect for human rights and full equality. The bottom um, countries are Azerbaijan, Turkey, Russia, and Armenia. Um, they were among the 49 countries compiled, compiled by the ILGA Europe, an umbrella organization of over 600 um, rights and activist groups, Denmark, France, Iceland, and Montenegro also rose in rankings. The report released on Thursday said the UK, and I have a special uh, story about the UK slipping for falling behind on its promises for reform while Bar Bulgaria and Romania were not far off from having the lowest rankings according to uh, in the EU, uh, and another member of the lowest ranking group, of course, is Poland. Uh, young people, and this uh, key story reminded me of this, young people are still particularly vulnerable. One report by the IGLYO, International Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, and Intersex Youth Student Organization said there's been a complete standstill on inclusion efforts in schools. One in two LGBTQI learners in Europe had experienced bullying at school, while anti-propaganda laws introduced in five European nations made it impossible for learners to receive inclusive content in schools. Uh, I think it's very apt and activists said that many of the advances we have achieved in our community over the past 10 to 15 years really pertain to adults. But much of the backlash is aimed squarely at youth. It's really important to remember that in a lot of cases, schools aren't that different from what they were 20 years ago. They children are still being bullied they're still being beaten up. And that's a tale for our time that applies nationally as well, I'm afraid. Um, let's go to the UK now, which has dropped to 14th on, uh, in rankings, arriving at 53 out of a possible 100. Um, this is, th what I'm talking about is the yearly rainbow map of 49 countries. Uh, it revealed that the UK had the most significant drop in ranking for equality rights this past year, falling from 10th to 14th place. And I've been chronicling its decline over the last uh, several months. Leading contributors to the loss in ranking and standing on the annual listing um, was due in part to the ongoing battles over transgender rights with a failure by Boris Johnson, the Tory-led government, to set gender recognition policies, especially in regard to a total ban on LGBTQ plus conversion therapy. The chief executive of Stonewall UK warned that years of crop progress on LGBTQ plus policy that was achieved under successive administrations has been rapidly eroded by a UK government that's taken its foot off the pedal. The um, group that put together the map highlighted the UK government's failure to extend a ban on conversion therapy practices to transgender people, which I reported at the time, as well as the abandonment of promised reforms on gender recognition and its equality action plan. It added that the UK also lost points because of the government's um, equalities watchdog, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, headed by that transphobe, uh, was not effectively protecting trans people on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity. The Stonewall spokesperson called on the prime minister to step back into the game as a leader 
in protecting and promoting LGBTQ plus rights. As we approach the 50th anniversary of the first pride in the UK, we call for his active leadership to rebuild our human rights institutions and to deliver a strategic policy program that enables LGBTQ plus people in the UK to live their lives in freedom and safety. So uh, let's turn to a more positive story from Europe and maybe a more colorful story. The leader of the Russian activist band Pussy Riot has fled Russia disguised as a food delivery worker. She first came to the attention of Russian authorities in the world when her punk and performance art group Pussy Riot staged a protest against President Vladimir V. Putin in Moscow's Christ the Savior Cathedral. Let's have a show a picture of her again, Maria Alokina. For, for that first act of rebellion in 2012, she was sentenced to two, year, sentenced to two years for hooliganism. She remained determined to fight Mr. Putin's system of repression, even after being jailed six more times. Um, since last summer, each stint for 15 days, always on trumped up charges, um, stemming from her political activism. But in April, as Putin cracked down uh, harder to snuff out criticism of his war in Ukraine, the authorities announced that her effective house arrest would be converted to 21 days in a penal colony. She decided it was time to leave Russia, at least temporarily, disguised herself as a food courier uh, to evade the Moscow police, um, who had been staking out the apartment where she was staying in. She left her cell phone as a decoy, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, cloak and dagger stuff. She went through Belarus. They turned her away at the border twice, but the third time was the charm. Um, she, she succeeded finally with the help of an is, is Icelandic activist. Um, she's 33. She spent her entire life fighting for her constitution and the basic human rights in Russia. After being freed in December 23, she and another member founded Media Zona, an independent news outlet um, focused on crime and punishment in Russia. She also wrote a memoir, Riot Days, and traveled internationally performing a show based on the book. Although her dream tour uh, was to bring the um, show to Russia, it only three venues agreed to host it and they all suffered repercussions. Uh, she made her journey in black three inch platform boots without laces because um, in her many stints in jail, the shoelaces were confiscated. So Pussy Riot is starting a big 19 stop tour in Berlin to benefit um, Ukrainian refugees and all the performers are going to perform without shoelaces. In prison, she and others threaded the moist towelettes through the eyelets of their shoes to keep them on. And so they're going to wear the shoelace apparel um, when they begin their tour. Uh, it first began more than decades ago. Pussy Riot seemed at first like a publicity stunt. They sang a punk in this action in the cathedral. They sang a punk prayer, ridiculing the symbiosis between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Kremlin, which has all come to fruition because the church's leader, Patriarch Krill, recently blessed Russian troops going to Ukraine. And the European Union put his name on a proposed list of people to be sanctioned. I don't think Russia has a right to exist anymore, she said even before there, there were questions about how it was, is united, uh, by what values it is united and where it's going. But now I don't think that's a question anymore. Uh, she was surrounded by other members of the group during this extensive interview in the New York Times. Um, now it's a collective with about a dozen members. Most of them have recently fled, including her girlfriend, Lucy, Lucy Stein. And her girlfriend fled when um, 
someone posted a sign on the door that she shared with Masha, accusing them of being traitors. So her her girlfriend preceded her. Um, and the fact that she was able to get out of Russia and Belarus was a reflection, she said, of chaotic Russian law enforcement. From here, here it looks like a big demon, but it's very disorganized if you look at it from the inside. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Now the Feminist Arts Collective and punk rock band Pussy Riot has taken to the stage with an anti-war message starting on Thursday. It performed for the first time in three years after their lead singer, whom I was just talking about, escaped. They're planning a 19-show European tour. So I went on at length about that. Good. So should we move on to someone else? I have some more stories I'd be happy to share. I don't know. Who was the timekeeper this time? I'm not sure when we started, actually. It's usually me, I know, but, huh? Let me continue. We what? are approximately halfway through our show. Well, okay. let me, I'm irrepressible. Let me just finish up, <laughs> at least with Europe. Russia launches a homophobic, guess who's gay reality TV competition. There was a deplorable, whose picture I will not show you, named Vitaly Malinov a homophobic Russian MP. He's presenting a new reality TV series where contestants have to figure out which of them is gay to win. During his time as a member of the state Duma, the far-right politician has made a name for himself as the author of the country's notorious anti-gay propaganda law. The 48-year-old is now presenting the online series titled I'm Not Gay, and is featured prominently in the first episode. Uh, finding a gay in our country is, find, is like finding a working McDonald's, he can be heard saying during a voiceover. They definitely exist, but there are very few of them and not everyone knows about them. At the end of each episode, eight men competing have to vote out the contestant they think is the gay one. They each share 2 million rubles, which is 21,000 pounds. It's that, that's the prize if they guess correctly. But if the gay man manages to avoid uh, detection, detection, don't you like this language? He takes home the money. I hope that you will quickly figure out the gay, Malinoff told competitors at the start of the show, making a throat slitting gesture as he did so. When they voted out the wrong person at the end of the episode, the first episode, he said that they had killed an innocent person. So that's what's going on in Russia, warm and fuzzy. Should I finish my um, two North American headlines and then save the Publishing Triangle Awards for my next segment? Well, uh, I don't know that you have another segment. <laughs> All right, well, let me show you a picture now, again, of Vicki Hernandez who was killed in San Pedro Sula shortly after a 2009 coup in Honduras. Uh, finally, the government publicly acknowledged that it was responsible for her murder. Um, her body was found in the street on January 29th, hours after the coup that ousted then President Manuel Zelaya from power. She and two other trans women the night before ran away from police officers who tried to arrest them because they were violating a curfew. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights last June issued a landmark ruling that found Honduras responsible for Hernandez's murder. The admission was part of the settlement. So there was a ceremony uh, acknowledging this involving the current president, Castro, who took office in January and Kerry Kennedy was there uh, she's, as we know, president of the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Foundation, which represented the family, and uh, Rosa Hernandez, uh, the victim's mother. And okay. are, are you done with that story? Yeah, well, I can finish it. I can yeah. be done. Yeah, and then um, if you have any, if we have any time left, you can then do the books. How's that sound? Well, let me just tell you about LGBTQ activist in El Salvador, Eric Ivan Ortiz. Let me show you his picture. 
he uh, lost his legislative race in 20, uh, 21. He would have been the first openly gay person elected to the legislative assembly in El Salvador. Now he's getting death threats, but he uh, vows to fight on. Now let's now end we, my segment. Now if we have time when we come back, uh, you can do your books. We'll see. Oh, we got to have time for that. That's the you upbeat. No, you might, you might have to do it next time. We'll see. Oh, we have in Texas, they can resume their child abuse probes of trans parents who are supportive of their children. But the Texas Supreme Court in allowing the probes to continue questioned the authority of the governor to order them. An appeals court had blocked the investigations, but the Supreme Court ruling in an emergency appeal from the state officials asserted that the appeals court had abused its discretion. In February, Governor Gre Greg Abbott ordered the Texas Department of Families to investigate parents who allow their children access to gender affirming care as child abusers. Brittany Greiner is in Russian detention and it's been extended. She's been in custody for three months now. It's been extended another 30 days before a new trial is set. The Olympic gold medalist 31 appeared at a brief hearing in handcuffs. She faces up to 10 years if convicted for a vape cartridge that was allegedly found in her luggage. So and here's a photo of her. Anti-LGBT candidate Kathy Barnett has a shot to win a U.S. Senate seat from Pennsylvania. I hope not. In addition to her being anti-LGBTQ, she is Islamophobic, Islamophobic, and she has uh, her support. In, she's seen her support in Pennsylvania get larger in the primary. She's called trans people deformed and demonic, and gay marriage will lead to exception, acceptance of incest. So aren't we excited about sending her to the state Senate? All right, now I'm here. Ravashi Bade, a legendary actus, activist for LGBTQ and civil rights has died at 63. She died Saturday in New York City, according to the National LGBT Task Force. Uh, she was executive director of this group from 1989 to 1992. The world has lost a giant in the movement. She's the author of Irresistible Revolution, Confronting Race and Class, and the Assumptions of LGBTQ Politics and Virtual Equality. Her longtime partner was Kate Clinton. So. Do you want to add anything to that, Ian? Well, the book I have is Virtual Equality. And, you know, she, well, Keith can tell you also, she um, railed against the mainstreaming of LGBTQ culture. It's very sad and, to lose and, her at such a young age. Terrible. Too. terrible. Yeah. And then, you know, there's a book um, about the New York City women's prison by historian Hugh Ryan, and he searched through the prison records in this woman's house. It's called House of, Deten of Corrections. Um, and it was in Greenwich Village from 1929 until 1974. In his newly re re released book, The Women's House of Detention, he lists such famous figures who were incarcerated there. Among them was Angela Davis, Andrea Dworkin, an activist, Afini Shakur, Topak's mother. Over decades, queer women were arrested for homelessness, for wearing pants, for being out at night. This is a vivid account of people being incarcerated, and many were working class women of color and trans masculine people. So that sounds like an interesting book. 
Yeah, didn't he write When Brooklyn Was Gay? Yeah, I think so. I'm looking that up now. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think that's probably all I have. Um, yeah, that's all I have. So, um, Keith, we'll move on to you. So, first, a note of transitions in our community. Justin Marsh, who has been the director of communication and development for the Pride Center, has announced that they will be leaving that position as of June 3rd. And good luck to you, Justin. Looking at our legislature, Approximately a third of the Senate has announced that they're not seeking re-election and half of the current chairs of House committees have also said they're not seeking re-election. Some of the notables in this group are on the Senate side, Becca Ballant, who has, is the president pro tem and is currently running for the U.S. House seat in the Democratic primary. Also in the Senate is a longtime ally, Washington County Senator Anthony Polina, who got the Progressive Party to support some of the early work that we were doing in the issues of non-discrimination. On the House side, the most notable person who has opted to step down or to not to seek re-election is Bill Lippert, who has been the longest serving openly LGBTQ plus legislator. And Bill has served for almost 29 years. But along with Bill, some trusted friends are also opting not to seek re-election, most notably Ann Pugh, who was the person who shepherded through all of the enhancement to Vermont's pro-choice statutes and was the person who shepherded through Proposition 5, which will be going out as a constitutional amendment this year to protect people's reproductive liberty. Also not seeking re-election is Callis Plainfield Representative Janet Ansel. Janet was one of the people within the Howard Dean's administration who worked directly with legislators to get support for some of our early pieces of legislation. Also not seeking re-election is Maxine Grad, who has been the chair of House Judiciary and has shepherded through the ban on the Trey and Gay panic defense. Also please note that both of Montpelier's representatives, Warren Kitzmiller and Mary Hooper, are also not seeking re-election. And I'm going to, again, highlight how elections really do matter. And part of that sense of urgency is looking at some of the things that are happening here in Vermont that are mirroring so closely that alt-right agenda on a national level. I'm not sure how many people realize that last Friday, the night before the Proposition 5 pro reproduction liberty rally at the State House, there was an event at the Capitol Plaza that was sponsored by Vermont Grassroots, which is an alt right conservative political group who says their mission is to empower parents and teachers. One of the speakers they brought in is the professor who was sanctioned for not using a transgender student's preferred pronouns who then appealed the reprimand and won based on a free speech lawsuit against the university where he was a professor. And we should not take this casually oh. because this same group has three more presentations scheduled 
for this summer into the fall, this is our election time with anti-critical race theory, conspiracy individuals, their intent is to come here and spread all of that hate. And we're already seeing some of it in Canaan, Vermont. This is in you know, the most Northern quarter of our state. There was an effort by a parent and community group to remove three books from the school's library. And the books that were targeted were How to Be Ace, a memoir of growing up asexual, a quick and easy guide to queer and trans identities. And why do I feel as though I'm in the 80s again? They tried to remove Heather Has Two Mommies. Oh, and to their credit, the school board voted unanimously that they're not removing the books. They might look at some of their library policies a little more carefully, but these books were actually not even in the pre-K section of the library. Apparently the library is already divided so that there are these sort of pre-K, elementary, middle school, and then high school. The parents that were behind this have said that, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity is not something that should be taught or promoted to students in the school settings. You know, those are things that should be talked about at home. Does any of this rhetoric sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And when they were questioned said, oh, we're not done. So, the other issue that we have going on here, and there was a little more clarity that's come out in some recent reporting. I had reported on our last show how there was a bill that had passed the Senate that was in the House Education that was going to look at funding and monies that go to public funds that go to faith-based schools. And apparently some of all of this came about because of a religious school in Bennington, Grace Christian School, that was investigated by the Department for Children and Families. And it was, you know, if the school discriminated, if they should be entitled to public monies. Now, one of the things about Vermont is that not every community has a school so they can tuition their students to a school of choice. And originally Vermont said you could not take public monies and give it to a faith-based school. And then there was a court ruling and it was that Supreme Court ruling that said, no, 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 you can't do that. But this school was being investigated because in their family handbook, it called homosexuality and bisexuality sinful and offensive to God and stated that rejection of one's biological gender is a rejection of the image of God within that person. Mm. And they made parents of students that were applying to be included to sign a statement that they supported the school's values. And it went on to say, this includes, but is not limited to participating in supporting or condoning sexual immorality, homosexual activity or bisexual activity, promoting such practices or being unable to support the morals of the school. They had their own statement of faith. What was interesting is that the Department of Children's and Families initially ruled against the school. The school appealed it saying, this is a witch hunt. Does that language sound familiar? And the commissioner overturned it. 
and said, no, the school is not in violation. So, and there is no real action that's happening at this point because people are, as we had said on the last show, are waiting for the Supreme Court decision on the main case, which essentially talks about this. You know, can you give public monies to a, to a school, a faith-based school, and could you separate the monies so that the parts of the educational process that were promoting a specific faith identity could not utilize the public funds? You know, it seems like a simple answer to me. No, you can't, but you know. It, but oh. this is going to be our US Supreme Court with this current of configuration. Course. And course. my last Vermont Bay story, and people may have seen this, there was a cadet at Norwich who has been denied entry into the Vermont National Guard because they tested HIV positive. Mm -hmm. and, apparent, and there had been a lawsuit recently against the Navy for not promoting an HIV positive airman. And they ruled against the Navy, said they could not discriminate. So what this as yet anonymous individual is saying, wait a minute, you're basing your prohibition about allowing people in because of their HIV status is based on 1980s mentality. It is not based on current treatment modalities. You are engaging in an unsupported discriminatory action that does no, that no longer has a medical basis. Mm -hmm. And as a related story, Canada has just recently removed all of their prohibitions against men who have sex with men donating blood organs or being held to a different standard than any other donor their current protocols are going to be based upon, it's not who you do it with, it's what you do. <laughs> yeah. So with that. Do we have time for, uh, for how much time do we have left, Keith? We, oh, have, we have about six minutes. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> Let me start by... Um clarifying that Hugh Ryan wrote when Brooklyn was queer, not when Brooklyn was gay in 2019. That's before the current book that Linda talked about. The Publishing Triangle is proud to announce the winners of the 34th Annual Triangle Awards honoring the best LGBTQ fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and trans literature published in 20. 21, and I know we're going to get to the trivia, Keith, so I'll go through this quickly. The Farrell Grumley Award for LGBTQ Fiction, presented with the Farrell Grumley Literary Awards, After Parties, a collection of short stories by Anthony Vesna So. Mr. So is the first posthumous winner of the award. He was a Kim, his, his parents experienced the Khmer Rouge, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. He committed suicide at 29 after the book was accepted for publication. The Edmund White Award for debut fiction goes to The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr., which I Linda love that book. Yes, a slave narrative involving a gay relationship between two slaves. It's on my list in the back, on my stack of to be read uh, books. The Tom Gunn Award for Gay Poetry goes to Punks, New and Selected Poems by John Keane. The Audrey Lord Award for Lesbian Poetry goes to Mama Fief Represents by Cheryl Boyce Taylor. Haymarket Books is the publisher. The Publishing Triangle Award for Trans and Gender Variant Literature goes to Asymmetry by Ari Banias. The Judy Grant Award for Lesbian Nonfiction, it goes to Mouths of Rain, an anthology of Black lesbian thought, edited by Brianna Simone Jones that Cheryl um, Clark mentioned in our interview 
about um, with the conditions collective. Uh, of are, all, are they almost done now, Ann? They're very interesting, but we have to leave time for the... Uh... The Randy Schultz Award for Gay Nonfiction goes to Punch Me Up to the Gods by Brian Broom. That's it. Good for you. That sounds like a great list. Congratulations to them and all the nominees. Trivia. So the answer to trivia is that May 17th, is International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia because on May 17th, 1990, the World Health Organization finally removed homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. Was, was that, there was a picture of the guy, he had like a mask on. One of the uh, psychiatrists who testified yeah. at the hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So on that note, we will all see you and we'll see you in two weeks. And in the meantime, however you can, wherever you can, resist. resist.